Welcome to Joy for the Journey, a worship service television ministry presented by your friends at the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. Our call to worship today comes to you from, drumroll please, 1 Timothy 1 verse 17 from the NLT translation. Let's read it all together before we go to the Lord in prayer. All honor and glory to God forever and ever. He is the eternal king, the unseen one who never dies. He alone is God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Merciful God. We want to begin by confessing that we, even today, already have sinned against you in our thoughts, in our words, and in our actions, by what we have done or what we have failed to do. We've not loved you with our whole heart. We've not loved others as ourselves. We're truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus, Lord, have mercy on us and forgive us so that we can delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Lord, we lift up Gary, my mom, Virginia. We pray, Lord, that your healing hand will be upon them. And we lift up to you the Stantons, and we pray that you keep them safe and bless their ministry in Hungary. Lord, hear our prayer. And finally, our mighty and everlasting God, you govern all things both in heaven and on earth. And please hear our prayers, the prayers of your people, and in your own time, give us your peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit as one God, now and forever. Amen. No, 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 don't sit, don't sit. Well, if you want to sit, go ahead and sit. But if you want to stand, would you please join me in singing Immortal Invincible.
now we've got some more music to enjoy. Good morning, church. It's good to be here with you this morning. Um, yeah, if you are able, please remain standing. Um, we're going to start with a worship song that um, Pastor um, requested. Apparently, this is a song that uh, we've done before, but uh, it was before my time, so... Um, if you know it, I encourage you to sing along with me. When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would requested it a couple of weeks ago for Matthew to lead um, at the end of service. So I encourage you to make it your prayer this morning. I walk through the shadow, your love. 
Father, we come to you today because we are in the midst of a battle, Lord, a battle that you have won, but you are fighting every day for us also. We ask that you make us your prayer warriors, Lord, and that you just continue to work through us to win the battle that, again, you've already won. I'd ask that you bless over this service, over the pastor's message, and just be with us. Let it sink into our hearts. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Today's scripture comes from Ephesians 6, 10 through 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. 
In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints and also for me, that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Good morning, church. Since it's been done on behalf of all the other staff, I just want to go on record to say that I love you all too, in case you didn't know that. Uh, right before the service, uh, Lily Truesdale made her way down to uh, uh, tell me uh, a joke. And so this is Lily's, uh, and it's a good one. What do you call a polar bear that likes to go bowling? A bowler bear. <laughs> Wasn't that good? Uh, we are in our second uh, week of this series on spiritual warfare. Uh, we had a break because we had a guest speaker last Sunday. Uh, so this, this is only our second one. We'll probably be in this for uh, several weeks. Um, Nick read for us uh, 10 verses, but I'm only going to focus on the first uh, four verses of this passage. We are in a battle. There is a spiritual battle that is ever raging uh, around us. And um, the Apostle Paul, as I told you two weeks ago, the Apostle Paul, in the latter part of this letter to Ephesians, he's really dealing with where the rubber meets the road. He's really dealing with the pragmatics of how we live the Christian life. And in the chapters previous to this, uh, he's talking about uh, how to conduct yourself and have a Christian marriage, how to be Christian parents and, uh, and, and share your faith with your, your children. He's talking about the workplace and how, whether you're an employer or an employee, how to conduct yourself in a godly manner. And lastly, he comes to this, which is spiritual warfare. And it's every bit as real, it's every bit as pragmatic, it's every bit as important and significant in your daily life as marriage, as parenting, as family, as work. It involves your everyday life, and that's what Paul is emphasizing here. And um, just like anyone who might enlist in the military, they enlist, and we don't just send them off to battle, but we uh, send them to basic training, there are certain things that you need to know so that you're ready and equipped for the battle. And so, as I said, we're only gonna focus on the first uh, four verses of this passage, but there's three things that you should know about the spiritual warfare that is uh, about us. And the first one is that we all need to know what is at risk. What is at risk? And what is at risk is you and me and all those uh, whom we love, our uh, family and friends and neighbors and co-workers and fellow students. Every day is a battle for souls. I pause for a moment because that is the reality. We may not think about it every day, but this is, this is the facts, people. Every one of us is going to leave this world at some point, right? And we will spend eternity either with God in heaven or in hell with Satan and his minions. Now, I know lots of people don't say that anymore. But that is the reality. And that's what's at stake. That's, that's what ultimately matters because this life is like a dot on a line. 
and eternity goes on forever. And so this is vitally important. Um, Jesus himself said, what would it profit a person if that person gains the whole world yet forfeits their soul? Or what can you give in exchange for your soul? There's two kingdoms, the kingdom of light and the kingdom of darkness. And we're operating in one of those here and now. Okay? You can't have one foot in one kingdom and one foot in the other. You're in one or the other. And Paul uh, says here, um, he says, for we wrestle not with flesh and blood. Now he didn't suddenly change his analogy from uh, talking about uh, kind of the Christian life as uh, a military kind of combatant situation uh, to suddenly a wrestling mat and uh, dealing with an opponent. Paul does change analogies sometimes in his writings and he'll jump from one to the other. But in this case, he is not doing so at all uh, because what Paul is emphasizing here is that the battle is up close and personal. That the battle isn't somewhere out there uh, that we can uh, uh, refer to, but the battle is right in our face. The battle is raging uh, uh, within us and around us. Now, don't get me wrong. Um, evil is systemic and cosmic. Okay, it, 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 is, it is permeated this entire world. And we have responsibilities as believers in Christ to wage war as far as in prayer for uh, righteousness and justice. So it's right for us to pray for brothers and sisters uh, in the Middle East. It's right for us to pray for what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. But if we think the battle is only somewhere out there, then we are missing what's really going on that we need to, uh, as he says, wrestle with. Because that word there is describing hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, not something from a distance that we can kind of uh, uh, feel comfortable and easy with, but actually something that's right here with us. And here is, here is the, uh, the nature of the problem sometimes within the church. Um, and I'm just going to be real honest with you. Sometimes when we're in church, and we've been in church for quite a while, we can have an us-them mentality. Do you know what I mean by that? What I mean is, we can point out all the sins of the world. Oh, those people, they are so messed up. They're doing this, 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 and this. And we fail to look in the mirror of the word of God and recognize where we're still falling short. Are you with me? Because this is important for us to get this. Because uh, a self-righteous attitude about being better than only repels people from the gospel. It doesn't draw people to the gospel. Our Savior was the king of the universe, and there's no one that walked on this planet more humble than he did. And so we need to take seriously that we are in a battle, and it's ever waging, and so we need to be reflective. Uh, we, we, we need to consider uh, things like um, how you treat other people. What's your thought life like? What captures your heart? What do you want more than anything else? Those will tell you some important things about where you and the Lord are or where Satan is working uh, in your life. Jesus put it this way in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and uh, lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. 
but rather lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys nor thieves break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What Jesus is saying is, who has your heart? Because there is a battle for our hearts, people. Because where our heart is, that's where our treasure is. Where our heart is reveals ultimately what kingdom we're operating in. What's going on with us. So first thing, we need to know what's at risk. The second thing, we need to know the vastness of the struggle itself. And the battle is on multiple levels. Paul's describing this spiritual hierarchy of evil realms. Um, we're told that our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. He's describing, he's describing a military uh, group in which, you know, you have your generals and you, you, you have all these different levels by which uh, the commands are made. And I think is as important as it is that we understand that there's this multiple levels of spiritual warfare going on. It's also vitally important that we take note of where the battle is not. What does the passage tell us? For our struggle is not against what? Flesh and blood. It is not against flesh and blood. This is January of 2024. It's probably vitally, in fact, I won't say it's probably, it is vitally important that we as the church remember that our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the evil forces. 2024. It's a presidential election year, isn't it? Since I turned 18, I have voted in every presidential election. Even when I was in Haiti, um, I got an absentee ballot and I sent in my ballot so that I could participate in the freedom and in the rights that we have as citizens of this country. In the last, uh, I would say, five, five to six presidential elections, I have witnessed this kind of rhetoric. This is the most important presidential election that will happen. And if the right person doesn't get an office, it's going to be awful. And I have watched church people, God's people, fret and worry and become anxious over what will happen. And I want to tell you that it is vastly more important who sits on the throne of your heart than who sits in the White House. And we need to remember that. Now, pray, vote by all means. But when the people of God divide amongst themselves because of who, whose party they're representing, the devil wins. He wins. Because we've just said this temporary stuff is more important than the eternal. And we've lost the focus. We've, we've made the struggle flesh and blood rather than the spiritual realm. Are you with me? Because, man, it, it's, it's going to get heavier as the year goes on. The temptation will get greater. And the opportunity to be divisive will be there. And we need to remember where the struggle is. The spiritual struggle. And that means that uh, we need to always be looking at how am I conducting myself as a follower of Jesus Christ? And am I representing his kingdom rightly? And so the devil, he, he, he is powerful, and he does use a lot of different ways in which he'll attack us. 
And so I just put in your outline there, uh, the struggle can be physical. It can be psychological. It can be social. It can be moral. After the outline, I thought it can be economic. And above all, it is spiritual. Because that's what he wants to mess us up on. Is our relationship with God. And if uh, we can struggle with that, then uh, we have uh, lost, in some ways, the witness that we need to share. And I think of an example which uh, we have in Scripture, one of the oldest passages in Scripture, Job, right? Satan, uh, Satan talks to God, and God says, oh, where have you been? He says, I've been roaming the earth. You get the impression that Satan's roaming around, and he's pretty pleased with how he's messed with people and gotten them messed up. And God says, have you seen my servant Job? Because God has a perfect example in Job of someone who's wholeheartedly living for him. And Satan goes, yeah, but he's got a silver spoon in his mouth and you've protected him and nothing can touch him and the only reason he loves you is because of the goodies you give him. He doesn't really love you. And God sets limits, but Job finds himself in a battle. He loses his wealth. He loses his children, his family. And finally, he loses his health. But you know what Job never lost? His faith. Because in the end, Job not only got all of that back, but God said to his friends who told him that he was messed up, and they really speak kind of like the devil speaks, you know, you're in a bad way because you've done something wrong. Had to. But God says, you guys were wrong, and you better ask Job to pray for you. Because he never denied the Lord. Now, he was very raw about what he said to the Lord. His struggles were very real. But you know who he always went to? The Lord. He knew who had the answers. He knew whom he was depending upon. And he continued to go back to him. You may be in struggles right now. But I want to tell you and I want to remind you that our God has not abandoned you. He is there and he is faithful. And you just need to turn to him. Give it to him. Rely upon him. Lean into him. And trust him. So, we need to know what's at risk. We need to know the vastness of the struggle. And thirdly, we need to know our enemy. We need to know at least a little bit about how he works. Um, and here's the thing about the devil. He is very powerful. The devil is equivalent to an evil archangel, okay? He's powerful, but his power is limited. His power is limited. Um, he is already defeated. Did you hear me? He is already defeated. He was defeated at the cross. He was defeated at the cross. Um, standing on the deck of the U.S. aircraft carrier in the historic moment never to be forgotten, General MacArthur walked over to Tojo the supreme commander of the Japanese forces at the end of World War II, and publicly stripped him of all his symbols of power. He took the sword out of his hand, he declared the victory, and enforced the terms of unconditional surrender. And people, that is exactly what Jesus did on the cross. Listen to Colossians chapter 2, verse 15, because as Paul says here, we've got this struggle with these evil forces, 
principalities, powers. Listen to Colossians 2, 15. It says, having disarmed the principalities and the powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them. That's our Savior on the cross. He took all the power of the evil ones and he absorbed it. And he vanquished their power through his surrender, which was victory. And so we need to live in the reality that our crucified, risen Savior has already won. Amen? And in knowing our enemy, Paul says, then we need to put on the full armor of God, which we will talk about that, those elements of the armor in another sermon, because I'm not keeping you till three today. Aren't you glad? Um, so, but twice, twice in this passage, he says, put on the full armor of God. Now, I confess that to that aid, and I'll confess it again in this service. I have reached this age where I find myself uh, on a fairly regular basis reminiscing about when I was a child. Anybody else in the room with me? Um, and, you know, we went through this really cold snap for a while, and then, you know, then we, we got the fog. But during that cold period of time, I was kind of thinking back to when I was a kid, and as I've told you before, I have one younger brother, and, um, when, and we were outside a lot. We just went outside no matter what the weather. And when it was cold, uh, Mom would say, boys, put on your coats. Now, when it's really cold, put on your coats, put on your gloves, put on your hats, put on your boots. I hated those dumb boots. You that live in this period of time, it's a whole lot easier. But those boots back then, you had, you had those little buckles that you just had to fiddle with. And I just wanted to go out and play, you know? It's like, it's, it's a struggle. Um, but if your feet were wet and you got them wet and you were cold, you were done for. So put on all the equipment. Paul twice tells them, put on the full armor of God. You know a takeaway from that? Here's the key takeaway. Yes, it is true that you and I are in a battle, but God has equipped us with everything we need. He has supplied, he has resourced us, he has given us all that we need for the battle. Now, those coats, those hats, those toboggans, those boots and everything, they wouldn't do my brother and I a bit of good if they were still in the closet and we were outside. My mom, she didn't quite wrap us up like uh, Ralphie's little brother in a Christmas story, but she sure made sure that we were warm enough because basically she understood that we couldn't handle those elements. And God knows that you and I cannot handle those spiritual elements. So he says, I will supply you. I will give you everything you need. But you got to put it on. Now we'll talk about the putting it on, but I, the takeaway today is God's given you what you need. So don't ever get in the middle of something and go, oh man, if God had only. God has and he does. <coughs> And two times he tells us to stand, to stand. Now, there are other times in scripture where we're, we're commanded and directed to move forward. But in this particular situation where he's talking about hand-to-hand -hand combat, I find it interesting that Paul just says to stand so that you might stand. His emphasis is not moving forward, it's taking a stand. Why? Because Jesus already won the battle. The hill has already been taken. We're just to stay there. Jesus likewise, in, uh, he, he, he tells a parable one time and he's talking about life. 
and how we should live our life. And he, he, com he compares and contrasts a wise man and a foolish man. You remember the, the parable? He, he says, anyone who hears my voice and puts into practice what I say is like a wise person who built his house upon a rock. And when the water rises, and when the rains come, and the winds blow, that house will stand. But he says, anyone who hears my words and does not put them into practice is like a man who built his house upon sand. And when the waters rise, and the rains come, and the winds blow, that house will fall. Now he's not talking about literal houses, though he was qualified to. He's talking about our lives. And our lives stand or fall on what is our foundation. And if Jesus is your foundation, if he's the rock on which you stand, those storms or those battles can come. But in the end, you can still stand. You get it? The only way, ultimately, that the devil can really get to us is if we let him. Earlier in this letter, in the fourth chapter, Paul says this. He says, do not give the devil a foothold. And I asked Marla to give us a picture of a mountain climber because that is the biblical picture here. A foothold. Just one little spot in which you can move on up. And specifically in the fourth chapter, the Apostle Paul, in this context, is addressing anger. And he's saying, don't let your anger get out of control, because if you do, you may give the devil a foothold. He's using that as an example, but I'm telling you, you can give the devil a foothold, and it may not be anger. It could be pornography. It could be cheating. It could be lying. It could be, you name it, right? You, you, you give him a little opportunity. We all know this from experience, don't we? Do you remember? I'm going to ask you to do something ugly for a moment, okay? I want you to go back in your mind. So when you were younger and the first time you did something that you knew was wrong, whatever that might be, you got it? You got that thing? Do you remember how bad you felt when you did that? And wasn't it easier to do that bad thing the next time? And the time after that? Are you with me? So we don't want to give the enemy the opportunity um, to get a foothold in our life, but rather to walk the path that he has for us. And in the midst of this, I realize I skipped a note in your sermon and it will fit in here perfectly as well because C.S. Lewis nailed it when he said, each day we become either a creature of splendid glory or one unthinkable horror. And what he's saying is, <laughs> out of repetition, you become what you continue to do, right? 
Righteousness, sanctification, all that is a process, right? We become more like Jesus if we're following after him and acting like Jesus, right? And we become more like the devil if we act and do those disobedient things. Are you with me? It's, it's just... It just becomes natural uh, for us. I'll close with this, and I need to give you the context of this quote from uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. John Bunyan's uh, wonderful uh, uh, story about Christian, who is on his way to the celestial city. And he's already encountered a lot of stuff. And at this point, he needs some lodging. The celestial city is within his eye shot, but he, he needs some lodging. And, um, and he's told by the porter because as he's coming to this, this, this house, this lodge where he can rest, um, he notices there's two lions, okay? Uh, and uh, he, he's, he's wondering, should I really go? And this is what he's told. Is thy strength so small? Fear not the lions, for they are chained and are placed there for trial of faith where it is or for discovery of those who have none. Keep it in the midst of the path and no hurt shall come unto thee. What's he describing He's describing, he's describing the devil's ability. He can, he can make us very fearful. He can certainly uh, threaten us. But like those two lions, as Christian walked the narrow path to the lodge, they've got their claws out, they're roaring. They can't touch him as long as he stays on that narrow path. And Jesus said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. People. Obedience isn't a word that people like these days, but we need to walk in obedience. And I want to say a word of encouragement to uh, any and all who are, uh, who are in the midst of a battle right now. So was Job. And God was proud of him. Keep walking in obedience. The victory has been won. We stand We stand from the position of victory. We don't stand to win the victory. He won it. We stand in the reality of that. I've I've heard it described of this passage, and I love it, that the devil is already defeated, and we're just the mop-up crew. He, he, He's done. His days are limited. His power is restricted. And his destruction is sure. We just need to stand in that. Pray with me, would you? Gracious and merciful God, thank you for the victory that was won on the cross of Calvary. It is a total mystery and great irony that you, O oh God, won the battle against evil by taking our evil upon yourself. You took all of our sin, all of our shame, all of our guilt upon yourself. You became our sin bearer. And by doing so, 
you, the perfect Son of God, the righteous Holy One, who never sinned in any way, in thought, word, or action, you never failed to do the will of God the Father, took the rightful punishment that we deserve for all our wrongdoing, and thereby making it impossible for the devil to have a claim on any and all who place their faith in you as Savior and Lord and walk after you. And so, Lord, you and you alone know where everyone's heart is this morning. Some may need to take that step of faith and step into the kingdom of light and say, Jesus, thank you for winning that battle. I want to be free and truly a part of all that you have planned and purposed for me. I turn from my sin. I turn from the evil one. And I entrust myself completely to you and your care. Some the more this morning, Lord, I'm sure are in the midst of a struggle. And they need the encouragement and reminder through the power of your spirit. That number one, it is worth it to be a follower of Jesus. And there's nothing that the devil can take from us but temporary stuff. He cannot touch our souls. And so, Lord, help us to live in the light of that reality and help us to confidently and boldly follow after you in obedience, in love and devotion. And Lord, may you receive all the honor and glory due your name as we live for you, following our King, our Lord, and our Master. We pray in his mighty name. Amen. Our hymn of invitation is uh, really a prayer, uh, puts a song, and it, it it, I chose this hymn because I think it emphasizes that the battle is right within each of us, um, that we surrender our minds, our, our everything. And as we stand and sing this hymn, if God has impressed upon your heart and you, uh, you know you needed to, to make a decision to follow him, to recommit your life, uh, maybe you're in the midst of a struggle right now and you just need prayer. There are counselors available. The altar is open. Feel free to come and do business with our God as we stand and sing together. May the mind of Christ my Savior.
Thank you for watching Joy for the Journey, a presentation of worship from the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. To learn more about the ministries of our church, learn how you can join us in worship, or to support this television ministry, contact us at 1804 South 9th Street, Mattoon, Illinois, 61938. You can also visit us at our website, www.fbcmattoon.org. First Baptist Church, a family for everyone.